Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 36th annual Ozark Mountain UFO Conference. As far as I know, there's only one conference in the country that's run longer than this, and that's the MUFON Symposium. Okay? This is the best conference anywhere ever. Um, I'm slightly biased, but it's true. So, here we are again, addressing this UFO phenomenon and its related topics, right? So, show of hands, how many people believe that real disclosure has begun? Pretty good, not everybody. Most people, that's good. Um, I, I agree with you, and I've been, in, I've been doing this since 1973, I guess I've been involved in UFO investigating, okay, a long time. And um, this is the first time in, in my career in this, in this field that I truly believe that real disclosure has begun, okay. Never before in history has the United States government openly admitted that UFOs are real and that they are not sure where they come from. That's the way they answer that question. I love it. You know, are they, could they be alien craft? We don't know what they are. Maybe. I don't know. You know, they won't give you a straight answer, right? But a couple years ago, U.S. government said UFOs are real. Everything is in the process of changing right now because of that, in the UFO field particularly, but in religion and politics, and you're going to hear a lot about these aspects of this disclosure. Do not kid yourself in thinking that this is going to go smoothly, okay? It's not, okay? Um, there are m many important and powerful people, people with great reputations in politics and in the military that are behind this. They're supporting it. They're coming out and they're talking about it. They're asking questions. We've had congressional hearings, for God's sakes. There's more whistleblowers in line to come forward and tell more and more things. Um, and so this is happening, um, but there are also large factions of people and organizations out there that want to stop it dead in its tracks. The power elite, whatever conspiracy names you want to use for these folks, the people that are protecting the industries of this world. So imagine if we had, if anti-gravity was affordable and we could all have it. We didn't need oil anymore. Can you imagine toppling the oil industry on this planet? You're also going to topple the steel industry and the rubber industry. And those are the three biggest um, industries on the planet. They will fall like a, a house of cards if this technology becomes available. So you can understand why these people want to protect their bank accounts, right? So somehow, we've got to get this information out without bringing the whole social structure of the planet down, right? But a war has begun. Don't kid yourself that it's not a war. They're fighting to now kill the reputation of these people that are coming forward. It's like, well, they have an impeccable career, and they have the technical background, um, so let's attack them as people. They're going to go after, they're going to find every dirty little secret that these whistleblowers have and start splashing it in the news, okay? Um, and so this war will go on. More and more information will come out. So this is what I, the question I think we should be asking, because it's never been the government's job to, to teach us about UFOs. It's not their job. So if you have been wanting the government to tell these secrets all these years, I think that you've just been wearing yourself out, because they're just not going to. It's not, well, we don't give them taxes for them to scare the crap out of us. Okay, we give them taxes so we can buy another big screen TV and come to UFO conferences and, um, you know, go out and have a steak once in a while. Okay, that's, that's, what our, that's what their job is, is to keep us safe and happy in the middle of the United States. Okay, it's not to go, hey, there's aliens out there. We don't know where they come from, what they're up to, but they're way more powerful than we are. Sleep tight. Okay. <laughs> so we should have never expected them to educate us on this phenomenon. But now... They said UFOs are real. Why? Why now? Why now have they come forward and said that? Okay, that's the question we should be asking. I contend that they will, would never tell us that UFOs are real unless they had to. 
if I'm right about that, what happened? What changed that made them go, we need to start telling people about this? Because this is happening at a very high level in our government and our military. What happened for them to change their mind and, and tell us about this and start educating the public? Now, they're not doing much to educate us. They're letting the information out. Guess who gets to educate the public? We do. Every last one of you need to go out here and tell what you learned this weekend to all of your friends, okay? Because it's not going to be, there's not going to be an admiral standing up here running a class on what UFOs are about, okay? It's still going to be up to um, the public sector to educate itself. Well, that's a free-for-all, for God's sakes, right? So to get informa good information, we have to make good information. We have to be very careful how we examine the, the evidence. We cannot jump to conclusions more than ever, okay? We've got to make sense and, and so that everybody can understand what's going on here so it doesn't bring this whole society down, okay? Sorry, that was, I got on my, I was going to say I got on my pulpit there for a minute, but <laughs> that's what I'm supposed to do. All right, so... Before I introduce our first speaker, I'm going to leave you with some words of wisdom from some people that I think are some of our greatest modern philosophers, the Moody Blues. Okay. Why do we never get an answer when we're knocking at the door with a thousand million questions about hate and death and war? Because when we stop and look around us, there's nothing that we need in a world of persecution that is burning in its greed. Why do we never get an answer when we're knocking at the door? Because the truth, it's hard to swallow. That's what the war of love is for. And we are fighting a war for love and for the truth. Don't make any mistake. So our first speaker today is, has been the State Director of Michigan for the Mutual UFO Network since 2004. After a lifetime of his own UFO and abduction encounters, he spent the last three decades actively investigating these otherworldly phenomenon, trying to make some sense out of the bizarre events that have happened to him personally. And I can tell you, there's not a single UFO researcher out there that hasn't had their own personal experiences. Why in the hell else would we do this, right? Um, what he's discovered confronting these cosmic mysteries is that reality is far stranger than he ever thought it could be. He is the author of, an, of two autobiographical books, Experiencer, Raised in Two Worlds, and its sequel, Experiencer 2, Two Worlds Collide. His personal abduction experiences have been chronicled in the sci-fi documentary, Abduction Diaries, streaming documentaries, Abducted by Aliens, UFO Encounters of the Fourth Kind, a television series, Alien Conspiracy, They Are Here, and the ABC News special, UFOs Seeing is Believing. He has also served as a consultant to Netflix, Unsolved Mysteries, the History Channel's Hangar One and UFO Hunters, National Geographic Channel's The Truth Behind, uh, The Truth Behind, as well as the Science Channel's Uncovering Aliens and Close Encounters. Please join me in welcoming Bill Konkaleski. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> wow, it is an honor to be the first speaker at this weekend's 36th annual Ozark Mountain UFO Conference. And I want to thank all of the organizers, all of the volunteers who have done such hard work to make this happen. I want to thank all of you for coming out to see my presentation today. A special thank you to anybody who is a vendor or a presenter um, who may have otherwise been able to sit at their table and engage with the people this weekend. And also a uh, special thank you to Dolores Cannon, wherever you are, for your everything. Okay. So, yeah, so 
I've been Michigan MUFON's state director now for 40 years. Anybody here, everybody here familiar with MUFON? Should be, okay. So MUFON is the world's largest civilian UFO research organization. Um, we have over 5,000 members in over 40 countries. What we do, of course, investigate UFO sightings. Uh, when people uh, report their sightings to us, we investigate them. In Michigan, we get a little over 200 a year, just in uh, that state alone. And I am here to talk about all the crazy weird stuff that got me into MUFON, that got me interested in this subject, that uh, it is a lifelong passion of mine um, to be in the space that I am. Uh, quick note for the art on my cover here screen. The uh, being there was done by a friend, Jeff Westover, and there will be more specifically about him in just a few moments. So anyway, yeah, so I do the MUFON thing, as I just said. Um, as you've already heard, I've done a bunch of TV stuff and also written two books, contributed to five other books. And my books um, cover, first of all, I would say about the first 20 years of my life and then the second book about the next five years of my life. I am a contact experiencer. I've had beings visit me my entire life, and I took good notes, put them into books, separated the content into areas that made sense, basically growing up, being raised in two worlds. And then in my 20s, when the beings seemed to take a very surprising interest in my mundane life. And anybody who is in the audience who's a lifelong experiencer, I'm sure can tell you the same, that for some reason, these beings seem to be interested in where we work, where we live, who we marry, all these little subtle details of our lives. And a lot of times when people come up and ask, hey, oh, so I heard you've had experiences, can you tell me a story? I'm like, yeah, I could tell you like a little snippet of one thing that happened to me, but that's never the full story. In fact, it, it's, it's almost distracting to what's really happening when you hear somebody's story about they were driving down a road, a uh, UFO came over, they had some missing time. That is but a thread in their life's tapestry of all the events that have happened to them. It is the big picture that is the real story. And that is never easy to tell quickly. And so I will do my best to give you, I think, the real picture about uh, this phenomena. Now, I grew up in Sterling Heights, Michigan. I have four older brothers, and the phenomena seems to run on my mother's side of the family. And I have cousins that have had experiences, my mom, my grandparents, also in my family. I'm the youngest of five boys. My two oldest brothers and I could go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a crazy story contest. The next two brothers in between us, zero between them, not a single thing. So I don't know what's weirder, <laughs> but uh, whenever we have a family get-together, you see my brother's eyes roll. I haven't had anything happen when me and the other brothers get going. And also, um, I'm not crazy. And here's, my <laughs> here's the best I can do that, can, that, uh, that I can prove that to you. Uh, okay, so I took the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Index, which is a, a sort of a test to see if I was fantasy prone. It said I was not fantasy prone, but I was reacting to phenomena that had happened to me, something that had happened to me that had made my life challenging and had given me stress. Um, I, I hesitate to use, word, use the word PTSD because I've seen people with serious cases of PTSD but the test showed that something affected me and I wasn't fantasy prone. So all this stuff on my face. Several years ago, um, Wayne State University um, a College in Detroit did a study on people that claimed they had contact. And the point of the study was to see if it was some sort of sleep paralysis, some sort of hypnagogic, hypnopompic um, hallucination that was happening to people who claimed these experiences. So they had a sample of people who said they were experiencers, and they had a sample of people that were the control sample. And what we all did, and I never got to meet anybody else in this group at all, what we all did was spend three nights, one, two, three separate nights, wired up like this in a hospital, 
across the street from the university, and they could monitor our sleep pattern. And what they wanted to see is that the experiencers had some kind of messed up sleep pattern. After the study was done, the doctors brought me into the office for the debrief and said that I had single-handedly spoiled their test because I had a better sleep pattern than not only all the rest of the experiencers, but all of the control group. <laughs> so go team experiencer. Yeah. Okay, so my first memory in life, very first memory in life, is from age two. That was in 1973. Um, here's a out picture of me from the time, and I was in my room, in my crib, it was late at night, and I was not quite yet asleep, when a little gray guy came into my room and stared down at me in the crib. This was not something that came back several years later, like, oh, you know, I think something weird happened to me when I was a baby or something like that. No, it burned in my memory the moment it happened and I never forgot it. <sighs> Little guy comes to the foot of my crib. I'm screaming for my parents. My mother in the next room groggily replies, go back to sleep, go back to sleep. And I wasn't even asleep and she never came. And after a few moments, the being just after it was done regarding me, walked out. And then that was, uh, again, my very first memory in life. Two years later, I would have a follow-up experience. I was, it was the afternoon, it was about 2 p.m., and all my brothers were at school still. My dad was at work, and my mother was outside. She's going to pick weeds. And so I decided I was going to take a nap. So I laid down on my bed, it's middle of the afternoon, and right when I hit the bed, I felt a full-on tingling sensation all through me. And then it felt like somebody grabbed my chest and pulled me out of body like a handkerchief out of a pocket. And then I found myself floating in my room, again in the middle of the afternoon, three little gray guys around me, and they had a very playful attitude. It was very nice, nice, and uh, aren't we all getting together well and everything like that? And they said they wanted to play a game with me. And the game was um, that I would come out in the hall, follow them out into the hall, and then drift down the stairs. I lived in a tri-level house. Drift down the stairs about six steps, and then land in the, uh, the room uh, down below, the family room. So I'm like, okay, um, sure. And what's odd is that it was at that moment I realized I didn't have any body to me. And I said, well, how do I do this? And they said, just think yourself down the stairs, float down the stairs, sort of um, imagine yourself laying on your belly and going face first, which is what I did. And as I got down to the bottom, I landed in some sort of falling leaf pattern. Uh, never mind, this is my great artwork. I'm not Jeff. But so anyway, so I... I, I came down the stairs and fell in sort of in a falling leaf pattern, and they were really excited. And I said, this is great, i got to tell my mother. And they're like, oh, no, 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 this is just our game. You know, this is just between us. And I was like, oh, that's strange. And then suddenly I felt a massive jolt of electricity going through me, and I was back in bed. And I got up, and I was like, and then I was like oh, my gosh, that was really weird. So I went running around the house looking for them. They were gone. And I was going to tell my mother... And I'm like, but they told me not to tell her. Okay, okay. What I'll do is see if I can reenact it. So I went to the top of the stairs, <laughs> laid on my stomach, and crawled down the stairs face first. And yeah, it was not the same. And I didn't tell my mother, at least not for a while. And the thing about it was that my brothers, my older brothers, were having experiences at this time as well. But there was a house rule. There was actually a house rule not to talk about it with me yet until I was older. I, they were very compassionate when I told them this weird thing happened to me. They would say, like, oh, it'll be okay. But they weren't allowed to share back with me anything that had happened to them. They didn't want to affect my perception of things. They didn't want to make me afraid. But they, it was a good house. I mean, if you were an experienced kid, this was the ideal house to grow up in, I guess. But um, so... When I was seven, yeah, I was very vocal about the event that had happened to me at that time. 
This was a, a really weird one, too. I was in my bed, it was the middle of the night, and I woke up to see a black disc, sort of a portal, directly above my head in the ceiling. And this metal hose-like device drops out of it, starts whipping around really quickly and shooting out sparks. And then I felt myself being sort of pulled up, sort of tugged into it, like a fish on a line, being pulled up into it. And then I was in a small, very close room with a bluish purple light in there and two little gray guys. It felt like a mud room. It felt like I was being um, uh, taken care of, like all the bugs were taking, being taken care out of, of, of me so that I wouldn't bring any infections on board or whatever. I even have a sort of a map at the time. So here's me at age seven. Um, I don't know how I got the spruce. I don't think it was part of this encounter. And no, my parents were very sweet people. So <laughs> I was just a good seven-year-old boy getting my bruises. So I'm at this sort of entrance room right here, and the two beings are with me, disinfected, that's the word I couldn't think of. And then the two of them brought me into this room here and to be joined by yet another being. So now there's these three little gray guys, giant black liquidy eyes, and I don't really seem to have any innate fear of them. I'm like, oh, these were the guys that came to play with me a couple, few years ago. And so they had me in this room, and I see this slab of a table, meaning it was basically just this chunk of a rectangle in the, in the middle, and I'm like, oh, they're going to want me to lay on the table. I'm not even sure where I got that from. It looked like a doctor's office. I'm not sure if it was some sort of memory that I, I hadn't pulled out yet, but I just knew. I'm like, oh, gosh, these guys are going to want me to lay on this table. But instead, they went out the door here. And I'm like, well, that's strange. They left me alone. I'm not paralyzed. So they went out the door this way, I'm going this way. <laughs> so I went through another door, walked around, uh, walked down a long sort of narrow winding hallway till I got to this room at the very end. And it felt like sort of a maintenance room. There was a sort of a metallic thing in there that looked like it might have been a furnace or something like that. Couldn't quite make out what it was. So then when I turned around, I see the three of them behind me, like they were following me, like, oh, this is interesting, let's see where the kid goes and because they knew I wasn't really going anywhere. So then they wanted me back and they actually led me into another room. And in the room, now the little gray guys that were with me were about three feet tall. They brought me into a room with a being that was about five feet tall, but otherwise looked very similar to them. This one had a very medical vibe to it, got the feeling it was a, a doctor, and it wanted me to sit in what looked like a dentist's chair. And I did. And then I felt stuck to it. There were no straps. There wasn't any sort of harness on it. I just felt magnetically attached to this chair. And the being gets up in my face with its giant black eyes and says, be really good and you'll get to see the color blue. And I'm like, you know, kids like suckers, kids like stickers. <laughs> I, I'm going to be really good and I'm going to get to see the color blue. OK. Um, and then he pulls back, and then I feel a very sharp pain in my arm. And I look down, and I see my arm has been sliced open. I don't know how they did it. I didn't see a device, or I didn't see any beam or anything. I just saw that my arm was cut open. But as I looked at it, it healed up as I watched it. It healed up in front of me. So I look back up at the, the being, you know, as in, what the heck did you just do? And it's in my face again with its giant black eyes that suddenly turned a brilliant, bright blue. Perfect cerulean blue. It was hypnotizing, tranquilizing, mesmerizing, and I just didn't even have a care in the world at that point. And then I woke up the next day with this scar on my arm that I still have on my bicep. Um, I know it's not easy to see, uh, but it was not there the day before. Went around to my family members. I'm like, something real crazy happened last night, and now I've got the scar on my arm. And they're like, it's okay, it's okay. Like, oh, you know. so, <laughs> so later in the afternoon, I'm playing with a boy across the street. Again, I'm seven, he's six. We're climbing trees in the backyard. And as we're back there, this white mist starts slowly rolling into my backyard. 
and it looks like a fire or, you know, that's what we thought, or somebody's barbecue or something like that. And then the, when the mist hit us, it was cool. It was like a fog machine. And I'm like, this is very strange. It was, it was warm out. I mean, we were kids out playing in the back, and it was summer. And then when this mist hit, um, in the center, I saw something in the middle of it come up towards me, and it was one of the little gray guys, and telepathically asked me if I was all right. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. And then it seemed satisfied, and then kept walking, and the mist, like a giant cloak around it, flowed out round and followed him. And he walked into the neighbor's backyard and the cloud followed him and he walked off into the distance. Now my neighbor, um, whom I'm still in touch with, says he clearly remembers the mist, but he never saw a being inside the mist. So up until this time, now again, we're talking 1973, 1975, 1978, so, you know, Close Encounters was out. I had never seen it. You know, the stories of, like, say, like Travis Walton or Betty and Barney Hill were out there, but I was not exposed to these things. This, this was all things that were happening to me out of context. And to tell you the truth, as weird as it was, I wasn't really making any sort of connection to it uh, with the UFO phenomena. These were just weird things happening to me that I didn't have a name for. It wasn't until I was nine till I would see my first, what I would call, UFO. And this was, although not close, not dramatic, it was very strange nonetheless. So looking up at the night sky, um, I was sledding and had got kind of tuckered out and was laying on the back of the sled, on, in the sled and looking up at the sky. When I saw this point of light, just looked like another star in the sky, but it was moving through the sky. You know, I think, you know, maybe plane, satellite, whatever. And then it did this really strange thing. Any time um, that it came to what it looked like it was going to collide with an, or another star in the sky, it would move around it. And it was doing this sort of avoidance of all the stars visible to me in the sky. It could make very sharp turns, move very quickly, and it was zigzagging through around the stars in the sky, never touching any of them. Now, what's impossible about this is obviously we're talking a super three-dimensional space. What I'm seeing only makes sense and can be interpreted the way I interpret it from my perspective. And I don't know what to make of that, but it happened, and that was my first actual, I guess, UFO sighting. So now moving into my early teens, more strange stuff. Yeah, my house was so weird, we had both Coke and Pepsi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, and these are not my cigarettes, just, just to let you know. So um, the experiences started to pick up in my teen years, and they were scary. I wasn't remembering them now. They would come, wake me up in the middle of the night. I would be tremendously startled, terrified paralyzed, and they would be at my bedside, and then I would I remember it the next day, like, oh my gosh, they came last night. But I can't remember the rest of it. And this was happening frequently. And many of the times that I would get up the next day, I would feel quite ill, um, and I would wonder what had happened to me the night before, and I knew something very physical was now happening to me. So I decided, in my defense, to create a obstacle course in my room. <laughs> yep, so, start, so here's me in the bed, um, and whenever I could bring the dog in with me, Sammy, I would. Um, she was, you remember the dog Benji? She was that type of dog, and so not a big killer or anything like that, but she was comforting to have in the room when I could. So next to me, I would have the light on, and I would, either have the radio on or the TV on. The curtains here were always closed so they couldn't recon inside the room. And then I had a built-in bookshelf here which becomes important in a moment. And then I also had, um, at my door, I played drums. And so I had a drumstick snared between the, uh, 
stuck between the dresser and the door. So anytime you would open the door, it would only open so far, and then it would go thunk. And then I also had a fan on, a floor fan, blowing air on me. So just in case when I started to close my eyes, I, if I felt anything pass in front of that wind the, the, from the, the fan, that I would wake up. And then mess all over the floor. Books, clothes, everything. And as much as compassionate as my parents were to say that, you know, my, I never cleaned my room because I didn't want the aliens to come, they thought it was kind of a weak excuse. <laughs> and, and I tell you, it didn't work at all. None of it. Not remotely. But I kept it up. It was my security blanket to do all this. Now, as I was talking about the um, built-in bookshelf here, that becomes important. Um, I don't know if anybody in here are familiar with uh, Moldavite. It's a stone. It's actually from space. Here's a picture of it in my hand. And it fell into the Moldau Valley in, um, at the time, Czechoslovakia. And so it's a sort of green crystalline structure. And at the time in my teen years, I was listening to a radio program on Sunday nights called Psychically Speaking with its host, Marcello. And Marcello said, was talking about in one of his shows, I was starting to dabble in crystals, not full on, and I've never been a full on deep dive into, into crystals, but he was talking about this stuff, Moldavite, and he said, you know, even if you've tried other crystals and it hasn't done anything for you, you'll be shocked at what you get out of this Moldavite. So I picked some up um, at the local crystal store and crystal corners, and I put it in my hand, and it instantly felt very warm, like almost uncomfortably warm. I'm like, wow. I'm like, what is it with this? And they're like, you know, it's, it's the magic or whatever. So, and so I was going to go home and meditate with it, which I did in my own amateur way. I brought it home, and I was meditating with it. Now, a couple months later, so every night... I would keep it up on this uh, bookshelf here. But then one night, after several months with this, I had a, what felt like a dream, I'll, I'll, I'll even classify it as that, of a shadowy figure coming in the room and taking the Moldavite. And so when I woke up, I looked, and the Moldavite was, in fact, gone. I'm like, that's weird. Who would come in and take my Moldavite? So, and, and it wasn't like it was going to fall off. This bookshelf was built into the wall, and there was no way to get at it. So something was going on. And undeterred, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go out and get me some more Moldavite. So, <laughs> so I did. I went back to Crystal Corners, and I got me another um, Moldavite, piece of Moldavite. And two weeks later, <laughs> I was keeping it in my pillowcase at night uh, for further protection. I wasn't going to leave it out of reach. So I would go to bed, put it in my pillowcase. The next morning, I would take it out. One morning, again, about two weeks later, it was gone. And I looked all over. It wasn't anywhere. I asked my mom and all that. No, nope, it's not around. So I'm like, darn it. I got some money. <laughs> I'm going to go back. I was 16 at the time, too. I could drive. I had uh, some money working at Taco Bell. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to get another st uh, Moldavite. So when I went to Crystal Corners, what's important about this is this was an afternoon trip. I was the only one at home when I got home. Nobody else was home. I returned from Crystal Corners. And when I went to pick it out, I remember very clearly it was sort of a shark tooth shape and it had a brown fleck in it, unlike the other ones that were just kind of blobby and I, it, tough to tell apart. This one had a very clear shape and a very clear artifact in it. So I come into the house, I had just purchased this thing. Again, just purchased. It's still in this little baggie, little plastic baggie. I walk in the house, put it on the shelf right at the door, go into the bathroom, come out, and it's gone. And this was like, this was like a minute that it was left alone and it disappeared. Nobody else in the house, and it was gone. And at that point, I'm like, well, if you can do this, then you're right, you got me, uncle. I can't, I can't do anything about this. So I was even more um, in a bad spot when I would try to go to bed at night. And I knew that I was having these continued encounters, and I knew they weren't going well, 
but I couldn't really remember much of what was going on during my teen years at all. And then um, I was brought on board. I'm like, finally, you know, I've got some clarity, I know what's going to happen here. I'm, they bring me up, I, I, or I should say, I came to on board walking down a hallway, technically. And I was surrounded by the little gray guys, not sure where they were hurting me, but then they brought me into this big room, and I saw a being that I had not seen before, nor have I seen since, which was um, a mantis being, is, is what I called it. And then interestingly, come now to find that's what people tend to call it, um, the seven-foot-tall thing looked like a praying mantis, and the little gray guys brought me up to it, and um, it had the feeling, again, I was in high school, had the feeling like I was being brought before the principal of the school, you know, to be scared straight. And this thing looked at me and it said, how come you don't go along with the program? And it's all telepathic. How come you're not going along with the program? If you just go along with the program, everything will go smoothly. You'll see, you'll understand what we're doing. It'll all be fine. And I was just terrified. This thing had such intense energy coming out of it. I felt like it could eat me alive. And I was very scared of it. But in retrospect, I was like, well, I'm not going to go along with these guys just because, you know, they brought out their mantis. <laughs> and, and so I, I, was still, I was still very resistant. And, and still not sure where to put all these things in my life. I was living my normal life, and this was happening at the same time. And so I'm kind of in two worlds about this. I'm like, this is strange. Nobody talks about this. Don't hear about it in church. Nobody, I, you just, you know, I was at a loss to put any context to this. Until, like many of you, um, kind of like when they say, you know, do you remember where you were when JFK was shot or whatever, if you're old enough? Many people in the UFO and experiencer community have their communion moment. That moment where you walk into a bookstore and you see that on the shelf and you're like, what the hell? Because you've been seeing this your whole life. And then you walk into a bookstore and you see it on the shelf and you're like, that can't be right. And it just, to me, just ice was flowing through my veins when I saw this. And I think it was Walden Books was the name of the bookstore. So I knew I had to have it. And my um, birthday was coming up. And so I asked for it for my birthday. And it was the fastest I think I've ever read any book ever. And it did what nothing else up until that point could do, at least put some basic context into what was happening to me. And it was like a checklist, like, Yes, that happened to me. Yes, that happened to me. Yes, that happened to me. No, that didn't happen to me. Yes, it happened to me. No, that, oh my gosh, he calls it a mantis, you know? And just those moments, it was like a roller coaster reading this book. And, and I'm sure a lot of you can also speak to the same going through it. And what I was hoping for at the end is like, here's how you can stop it from happening. Here, here's why it's not as bad as you think. Here's, you know, some sort of positive thing, something I could take away from it and move on. But no, it just kind of left hanging. And I was like, oh my gosh, now what? Now I think I'm being abducted by aliens. But what to do about this? I don't know. And it wasn't that long, actually, the same year, by the time I got around to reading Communion, that transformation actually came out during the same year. And I got that for Christmas. And reading that, I, instead of reading it very quickly like I did communion, I read transformation very slowly because I was nervous about every chapter I was going to read next. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to read about anything else that has happened to me in my life because there was a real dread of realization in my life at that point. And so I read it slowly, very slowly, and then it came to the last chapter and I said, I don't think I, oh, no, 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 getting up slightly ahead of myself. Come to a chapter, Whitley says he receives this sort of download. The beings sent him a telepathic message, says, Whitley, come to the park. And so he does. He goes to the park and he has an experience. And that was in my no box at that point. I was like, no, nope, never had anything like that happen to me. And then right when I said that to myself, essentially, I got a download. 
it said, finish the book and we will prove to you that we exist. I'm like, okay, that's just my thinking. That's not my, but it didn't feel like my thought. It clearly was my thought. And it occupied my head in a strange way. It was just sitting there. I couldn't do anything with it. It was like a, an immovable object in my head. I'm like, yes, this must be what the... So I was very nervous then to finish a book. Got to the point of the last chapter and said, I'm not going to finish a book. Yeah. And then, oddly enough, I had a dream um, in February 1989 um, that I finished a book. Very strange. I had a dream that I finished reading a book. And I did, and so I woke up. I'm like, oh, gosh, today's the day. Okay, okay. I got no school today. I can manage my whole day. All right, so I finished the last chapter, and it's kind of unsensational. I think in it he talks about somebody going to a bookstore and they're grazed in the bookstore talking about the book communion or something like that. Um, Not remarkable in terms of its content, but then when it was done, I'm like, okay, I felt a target painted on me. I'm like, something's going to happen, and I have no idea what. It's 9 in the morning, and so I said, I'm just going to make sure I am not alone at any point during the day. I am not alone the entire day. I'll start with that. So here's me, kind of what I look like at the time, pretty typical for the age. And these are my friends that are getting, we're now getting into the second phase of my story, the part where the beings really seem to take an interest in me and pull back from me just being like a, a, a medical dummy and actually having some sort of communication, some sort of give and take, some sort of back and forth. And, okay, so this is my friend Herb, my friend Kyle, my friend Don, my best friends in life, close, very close people. Here's me. And so on the night, on that night in February 1989, we're in Kyle's Um, Chevette, and Don is with me, so it's the three of us, Kyle, Don, and myself, that night. And we pull up in front of this friend's house who gets out of work at about 9 p.m., and since it's February, it's dark. And we're sitting there in the Chevette, and while we're there, this blue ball of light about the size of a car, about the shape of a football, about the height up above us of two telephone poles, does a slow maneuver over us, sort of spiraling slowly through the sky over us. And the three of us watch it. And then this white ball of light comes and zigzag, ping pongs all over the sky, just zigzags very quickly everywhere. And then that disappears. And then this red ball of light appears in the middle of the sky and grows to the size of a full moon, which is quite large, right? And then it shrinks again and disappears. So the three of us all saw it, all saw the same thing, we're in complete agreement what we saw, and then now what do we do? So my friend um, Kyle says, you know, maybe we should tell the police. We were high school seniors, you know, we're like, yeah, we're going to tell the police we saw a UFO, what good is that going to do us? And then so my friend Don's like, yeah, why don't we tell Selfridge Air National Guard Base, which is quite close. Like, okay, so you're not going to tell the police, but you're going to tell the military? We're not going to tell the police, but we're going to tell the military. And so that, that was really odd. And in fact, the next day, so I was thinking, oh my gosh, is that not proof? Is that not proof in the form of a UFO? Like the format of what is happening to me? Because my brothers um, also lean more heavily on the ghost side than I do. So this was a very clear indication to me that something was happening and that It was UFO related. And the fact that I was with two people, I have two witnesses to this day remember it exactly the same way. And just in case I thought I could still ignore it, the next day I go into work and turns out the maintenance guy saw something very similar. He saw a blue ball of light moving down the street. And when I was talking about it with another coworker, she starts crying because she said that reminded her of a time when she was a little girl in Tennessee in the back seat of a, her parents were in the front seat, her and her sister were in the back seat. They were driving down a dirt road and there was a UFO parked in the meadow. And she said her dad wanted to go out and take a look at it. And the mom and the two daughters were like screaming, shrieking, no, what are you doing? You're crazy. And then he like floored it. 
But she said that still very much affected her. So I'm like, okay, bonus, like a land yap of uh, additional um, confirmation of this. So I was um, puzzled by this because here they were sort of giving something back. It was just confirmation. It wasn't a gift, but I wasn't really what, sure what to do with that. And later um, that summer, just a, a few months later, um, I was in my kitchen. It was, I, I was a dedic, like when I graduated high school, I'm like, that's it. I'm staying up till sunrise every day. I'm finding a job where I don't have to go to bed early. I'm taking classes at the college when I can in the evening. So just so I can push everything as that I could stay up as late as possible. And to some extent, um, I found a work schedule and a school schedule that was able to allow me to stay up quite late. So it was the summer of 89, it's about three in the morning, and I start to get that, fe I'm sketching in a sketchbook in my kitchen, and I start to get that feeling that they're there. There's that undeniable presence. I'm like, okay, oh gosh, you're here. Now what, it's three in the morning, I'm in my kitchen, and I, I could sense they're in the backyard. I'm like, oh gosh, and I said, I don't wanna see you, I said, I said, I don't wanna see you, but if you want to talk to me, you can call me on the phone. So here's my old house. This is actually the phone in question. And it took about a few minutes, but, and, and, and I still felt that tension growing. And then the phone rang. I'm like, oh no. I'm like, I don't want to answer it, but if I don't answer it, are they coming in through the wall? And I'm like, darn it, I set a trap for myself. It took about five minutes for me to go and pick up the phone, and it was a dial tone. But because of that, I felt everything sort of dissipate, the energy go. I'm like, okay, all right. So this was just, they were fine with just calling me on the phone. No sense of missing time or anything like that. And then the next day, I'm sitting in my backyard saying, oh my gosh, why didn't I just run for the phone and pick it up? Why did I hesitate? Here was my chance. I was having some sort of, excuse me, um, terminology, communion with them. You know, I said something to them, and they said, okay, we'll communicate on your terms, and then I left them hanging. So I, I was kicking myself about that. So next summer, turns out, happens again. I'm in my kitchen, sketching in my sketchbook, it's about 3 a.m., and then I feel that familiar sense that they're there in the backyard, and I say, again, if you're here, you know, I don't want to see you, but if you call me on the phone, I'll answer right away this time. And right when I said that, the phone rang right away. And I'm like, this is one of those moments I cannot think, no fear, no thought, just action, dashed for the phone, picked it up, and again, dial tone. But this time, I felt they were still there. So I hung up the phone, I'm like, okay, okay, what else can I do to get them from coming in? They, you know, they called on the phone, I answered it, they're still here, they're not satisfied. Oh, gosh, you know, and, and so I, I'm thinking, how can I have this sort of middle ground with them where they're not just gonna come in? And so I'm like, okay, while I'm thinking about this, I'm gonna go get the family dog to keep me company. So I go and she's sleeping in my parents' room, and so I didn't wanna wake up the rest of the family, oddly enough, but. So the dog comes out, and of course she thinks that means, oh, we're going for a walk? We're going outside? I'm like, oh, no, no, no. And she starts yelping and running around in circles. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I think, all right, okay, they say that dogs are sensitive to this sort of thing. And she just wants to go out. She's not sensing any sort of threat at all. So maybe, there is, maybe it's just my imagination. So um, I'm like, but we are sure not going out into the backyard. We're gonna go, I'm, I'm gonna let her out the front door and watch her as she goes in the front yard or something. She wasn't having that. She goes out in front and then she's running around yelping at me like, come on, we're going for a walk, right? And I'm like, don't know, they're in the backyard. They'll, you know, they'll hear you. So, so anyway, so I step out with her and we go as far as the street. And this art was done for me for my first book by Mike Clellan, who was an experiencer and a writer and um, an artist and many things, great things, and he's a good friend. 
So here I am at the edge of my driveway. Here's my house, and the dog's doing her business. And the sky is completely clear, except a single perfectly disc-shaped cloud hovering over my house. Very crisp, um, well-defined, but very much a cloud. You look at it and say, yes, technically that's a cloud, but it's a perfect disc. And the wind is blowing, and there's nothing else going on in the sky. And then as I'm watching it, it slowly starts to drift off, and then boom, just floors it and takes off into the sky. And then so the dog, completely nonplussed. So I don't know what they say about dogs in this thing, but that's my experience. And so we went back in the house, and it was about 4 a.m. by this time, and I just waited in my room until my father got up for work about an hour and a half later so I could hear some comforting noise in the house, and I fell asleep. So about noon, um, my mom wakes me up and says, your friend Kyle is here. And, and so I go, all right. Um, so I go down and say, hey, Kyle. And he's like, uh, he goes, so, uh, so what have you been up to? And I said, well, this, is, this was my last night. And yeah, he had some experiences too, not at the same level that I seem to have, but um, I could tell him anything about what was going on. And he was like, oh, that's really interesting. And he's like, so um, are you going to our friend John's uh, birthday party? Um, it's in about a month. And my response to him was, I'm like, oh, is Vicky going to be there? And, and I'm like, because she was a friend of ours. And I don't know why, what made me say that. And he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, um, you got a thing for Vicky now? And I'm like, I'm like, I can't really say that so much, but she and I are going to start dating. And it's going to happen at that party. <laughs> and he's like, oh, killer, you're good confidence and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you know, it's not even like that. It's just like, it's just to me, it's going to happen. And I know it. It was just a sense of knowing. And sure enough, at that party, um, we're playing croquet, and she hands me her phone number. She says, oh, call me sometime. Um, and so we started dating. And at first, it was pretty fabulous, actually. Um, you know, I'm, I didn't go grudgingly into it at all. Um, she was a good friend and now a good uh, girlfriend. And so things seemed to be going pretty well. And I will interject with this um, so we started going out in the summer of, it would have been 90, and in January of 91, I throw in this experience, I'm walking down this cold and snowy road in the middle of the night, I don't have any jacket on, I don't know how I got there, I don't know what's happening, I'm just walking, I just find myself walking down this cold and snowy road in the middle of the night. It seems quite rural. And as, and I see this house up ahead, I'm like, maybe I could go knock on the door of these people, have them let me in, give me some sense of what's going on. It was one of the strangest things ever. And as I got up to the house, there was a little gray guy in front. And when I saw it, I felt it looked into my eyes, and this time its eyes switched from black to white, and I felt suddenly every negative emotion I've ever felt in, in my life. Anger, fear, regret, just anything negative. It just hit me like a nuclear bomb, and I felt I disintegrated, um, all from the stare of this thing in, uh, in, <clears throat> in, my drive, in this driveway, I should say. And then as I disintegrated, I'll put it that way, I find myself in my bed, it's in the afternoon, I'm drenched with sweat, and I thought, well, what just happened? I'm like, that was not a dream. You know, I've spent 20-some years dreaming, and I know that was absolutely 100% real. Every aspect of it was authentic, but yet impossible. And uh, many years later, I would fall upon uh, a great quote that I loved from um, Sir William Crookes. He was a physicist in the 1800s, and he was Nobel Prize winning. He was, you know, a very smart guy, but he was unpopular in the scientific community because he would attend seances. 
and he would report that what he was seeing in seance is something unusual was in fact happening. And he got ribbed by one of his fellow scientists that says, How are you, why are you looking into these seances? He goes, you know, that's, you know the, there's nothing to it. That's just simply not possible. And his response was, I never said it was possible. I only said it was true. And so that was the strange feeling I had at that moment. What happened to me was not possible, but it was true. And so I wake up, I'm in this sweat. I just disintegrated. Sucks when that happens, right? So knock on the door, my mom walks in, and she drops a letter on my chest without a word and walks out. And it's a Dear John letter. And, and I was like, I'm reading it, and I'm like, okay, girl breaking up. And I just kept thinking over in my mind, you know, the creature, the creature. Oh my gosh, this thing was horrible. The creature, the creature. So at the end of the letter, she says, you can call me if you want. So I'm like, oh, imperative, action item, call girl, okay. So I get off and I walk over to the phone and I call her. Now she had sent this like on a Friday and I got it on a Monday and we had spent a great weekend together. So I call her up and she's like, is this Bill? I'm like, yes, and I'm thinking the creature. And, and she goes, oh, she goes, oh, did you get my letter? Yes, the creature. And then and she goes, she goes, oh, she goes, I sent that Friday, but I kind of changed my mind. Is it okay if we just kind of forget about that? And I'm like, yes, because all I'm thinking is the creature. I'm completely anesthetized to whatever is happening in this lane of my life. And then she says, oh, she goes, you want to come over tonight? I'm like, yes, the creature. You know, seven o'clock? Yes, the creature. Okay. So I go in and I pick her up at seven and we're together. And it wasn't until like several hours that we were together. I was like, why the, what the hell just happened? So um, as the months would go by, she and I would just sort of break up over the next summer. It was not spectacular. You know, it just, it just happened. And then my friend uh, Kyle tells me um, a couple months after Vicky and I broke up, now, this all plays into the UFO stuff. You know, I'm not just waxing nostalgic, right? You, I hope you understand that. And I'm making my point that they're interested in our mundane lives. So it's, it's the middle of summer. Vicki and I now had been broken up a couple months. And my friend Kyle says to me, he goes, uh, he goes I got something I want to just get off my chest. He's like, uh, after you and Vicki broke up, we dated for a couple months. I'm like, oh, that's kind of tacky and... Kind of weird that you didn't tell me. And, but I'm like, okay, whatever. I guess no foul, really. And he goes, yeah, but it wasn't as bad as what our other friends, Herb and Don, did. He, he said, they were actively with her while you were dating her. Uh, as in, they would drive over together. And yeah, so I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> right? I'm like, and, and not only, okay, so... I'm sure you experience this. You have your core set of friends, and then you have what you kind of consider your satellite friends, still good friends, all part of the same group, and then it extends out. Turns out, as far as I could extend my, line of, my group of friends, they all knew about this. I was the only one who didn't, and so I had to think back, how many parties did Vicky and I go to after those guys were messing around where everybody at the party knew except me? I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to step back from this group of friends and reorganize myself. And at that same moment in my fall classes at the college, um, we were learning about um, free will, determinism, that sort of thing. And if, if there's any sort of uh, scientifically, uh, psychologically, psychiatrically oriented people that can sort of have a real opinion on this, I understand that I'm just going to get into the broad, this in broad strokes. That essentially, when you learn about determinism or like um, philosophies, it really means that it's all about the cause and effect. People are who they are because of what happened to them, and you can't really blame anybody when they do anything that you don't like because it's really all part of their upbringing. Cause and effect. So I'm thinking, well, like Herb and Don, you know, they, had, they couldn't help themselves. It was all based upon what they'd experienced up into life at that point. And I'm like, oh gosh, you know, but that's hard to take. And during the same period of time, um, my parents told me they were getting a divorce. 
my girlfriend at the time um, had left me the um, house, and since my parents were getting a divorce, the only house I knew um, was going up for sale that I had lived in my whole life. Basically, everything went, you know, I, I jokingly referred to it at that time as my autumn apocalypse. <laughs> and so I, I found other groups of friends, and I started to think back, like, geez, who, who do I have in my life right now that I feel knows me that is kind of with me. And it's so weird to say that these little gray guys were like the constant in my life. And if you have to go to them for your <laughs> moral support, you're at a pretty low point in your life, right? So, but I'm like, okay, all right. All right, so I'll just, I'll just sort of go with it. And then I started thinking, Perhaps that one experience I had when I was walking down the snowy road and I saw the being there and all the negativity and I came to in my normal environment and I received that letter on my chest, that was them saying, prepare for what's about to happen and we're with you. Just know that from this moment on, you know, this is, this, this, you're going to be down the snow cold road by yourself sort of a thing. So I'm like, okay, that seems to make some sort of sense, a bit dramatic way to, to deliver that message, maybe, but okay, I'm going to sort of go with it. And so at that time, the love thing in me was just sort of turned off. You know, here I am in my early 20s, should be having a great time running around dating, all this stuff. And then... The little gray guy <laughs> um, decided to uh, bring me a friend one night. <laughs> yep. So <laughs> they're like, you know, we're sorry about what happened, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know, I know it's crazy, it's, but when you live it, hmm. So, so anyway, so one night I wake up and they're in my room and there is this nude girl with them. And, and I'm, I'm looking at him, I'm like, what are, you, what are you doing? What's going on here? I don't understand this. And, and I'm thinking, like, you're not thinking that, you know, she and I are going to smooch, do smoochy stuff or something right here, right? And, and I felt like, I feel now then, and I didn't feel scared, I was just confused. And then it started to well up in me. I'm like, what a rude thing to do is take some girl drag her to some guy's house in the middle of the... She looks frightened. She looks... And then they're like, no, 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 she's a hybrid. So it's okay, she lives on the UFO. Which I was later to find out um, in, in content beyond my talk today, that was a lie that they set up to, to make me feel better. She was 100% human. And so, so then, not knowing what to do, I said, okay, what's her name? And they're like, yes, yes. And this is all telepathic. What's her name? They wanted me to name her. Like, okay, I just thought, you know, what could I name her? That's something sweet. I'm like, Angel. And they're like, yay, Angel. <laughs> and, then, and then as I watched, the four of them slid sideways through the wall and disappeared. And I'm like, what the? Yeah, right. So um, it would, it, there would, there would, again, there's more content with this that is beyond the scope of this presentation. But yeah, I, I'm like thinking, I'm like, wow. Did they do that to, to make up for what I was going through? Hmm. And then another mysterious thing happened not long after. I fell asleep watching TV in the front room. This was a couch. Imagine me floating down the stairs at age four here, basically. Here's a bay window out into the front yard. I'm laying on a couch. This is just art, AI art, but to reproduce the, the look of it. So I'm laying on this couch asleep when I'm hit in the face with a spotlight. And then I wake up and I'm laying there on the couch. I'm like, what was that? And I see the spotlight moving through the room and then another spotlight and another spotlight. And they just keep going. It's absolutely silent. And I look out the window and I can see quick glimpses of something flying through the air, shooting these spotlights. And I wasn't afraid at this point either, so 
I go, I open the main door, the screen door is still there, I go through the screen door, I walk out into the front, and I'm looking, and I'm seeing these black triangular craft, not very large, more like fighter size than bomber size, I guess you could say, and they had a white spotlight in the middle that they kept hitting my house with, and then it had two also lights in the back. So I'm walking out into the yard, watching these things just fly over really, really quickly, and... I should have been looking in the yard, because in the yard there was this sort of dome bullet type craft. Here's the th things that, what they look like flying through the sky. And in it, um, there was a store with a little gray guy and some sort of box like contraption in his arm. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I was set up. So I run, <laughs> so I run to the house, I, and, but as I start to run to the house, I'm feeling slow and tired and heavy and I just barely get into the house and fall over and I knew this thing was still coming and it's thought process to me over and over again is look we have something to show you you need to learn from this this will educate you this will give you information that sort of vibe um, I had a regression session around this and I just don't think it added much more honestly to my understanding of what that information was that they, they wanted to tell. But, um, but yeah, that was, that was a very scary one. Um, so I went to MUFON in 93, um, and this is the home of George and Shirley Coyne. Shirley at the time was MUFON's, uh, she was not only Michigan's state director for MUFON, but she was also the international director of in, uh, abduction investigation. And so very qualified person to go to with my encounters. Now, I took this picture of their home after they had moved out. So why the current owners have, if you can see, their screen door on the outside of the railing, <laughs> not on the inside. I, 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 it's beyond me. But so anyway, so George and Shirley live here. And so I did a series of regressions based upon the encounters that I'd had up until that point in my life. And the great thing about Shirley and her professionalism, she knew how to do it right. She didn't make suggestions of what she thought I was going through up front. I mean, there was no frosting that she put on it. Basically, it was, oh, and then what happened? Oh, and then what happened? Oh, and tell me more. And then... At, as I gathered up all my notes, she said to me, all right, now take these notes, put them together, see if you can get some sort of outline, see if you can pull some meaning from it, which is when I really started to make these connections. And then when we come back, you know, at some point we'll go even further into it and maybe we can speculate together. Perfect way to do this for, for anybody. So if you are going to somebody who's regressing you and then saying, you know, I think Arcturians or something like that, you know, just, you know, this is, you got to meet the experiencer where they're at. Let them collect their story, review their life story, and then maybe bounce it up against different theories and, and things like that. And so I was so blessed to have this. And she did it for free, which was great. And our very last session was really weird. Um, she, um, I came into her home, and her husband, George, who was MUFON's Midwest director at the time, was laying on the couch just outside, he was here, just outside the room, which would have been about here, where we always did our regressions. And the regression sessions were very helpful. Um, my best example of that is when we went back to H2. I didn't really remember anything more than the being coming in and going, but the description of my room, the details of my room, came out in ways that I had forgotten. For example, the way that my crib looked under hypnosis, not under my normal natural recall, was the correct version. The correct version was what I came out with in under hypnosis, just to give a sort of an example. So I was all in on hypnosis after that. So the very last session we had, I, am, I sit in the big lazy boy chair and she does the induction and I'm laying there and then I, I'm feeling lighter and lighter and lighter. And the room is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And my eyes are closed and I can't open them. And 
unlike all the other times that we'd been through this, when she said, look at this thing in your life, and I would look back at it and remember things, anytime I tried to focus on anything that had happened in my life, I could not. I was blocked. It was like this haze went over everything, and I'm like, I, it's just not working. And that's when the light uh, came. I felt lighter myself, and pretty soon I found myself floating in a pure white space. I felt like I had no physical form. I'm just out there in pure whiteness. And I says, uh, okay, you know, I'm nervous, and I hear this voice come to me and says, you always focus on the wrong things. You look at this as a negative experience. You don't see the, the, the good side of what's happening to you with this. And we're here, and you are concerned that we're you know, going to come back again in your life. And the voice said, it was a deep sort of bass male kind of telepathic voice. I said, you know, we're here, I'm here to guarantee you that we are going to come back in your life again and again and again. I'm like, that, that doesn't sound very helpful. <laughs> but but is, that your, is that your supportive message? So, but anyway, and he said, but you'll be okay. And, and that was it. And then the room started to get darker, darker. I felt heavier and heavier. And then it felt like somebody slammed me into the chair, like I was 1,000 pounds, and I slammed into this chair very heavy, and I couldn't move for a moment. And then when I came out of it, Shirley was like, oh, we lost you for a little while there, meaning she thought I had fallen asleep. And I didn't know what to say at first, so I said, I think I need to go to the bathroom. So she says, okay. So I get up and I go to the bathroom. And again, they live in a trailer, so the walls are pretty thin. And while I'm in the bathroom, George says to her, I could hear through the wall, through the door, George says to her, he goes, there were three of them here the whole time you were in there. She's like, what? She goes, the moment you guys went in there, like a, maybe a couple minutes later, three of them appeared at the end of the hall, and they stayed there until just a couple minutes before you got out. They're not telling me this. I'm in the bathroom, I'm overhearing it. I come out of the bathroom, and I look, and they're both very ashen. And, and I said, oh, so what's up? And then they kind of look at each other, look at me, and Shirley's like, oh, nothing. <laughs> So I'm like, I, I thought I heard you say something just a moment ago. And she was like, no, mm -mm, no. <laughs> and, and, and she goes, so how was your session? You know, she goes, um, you know, let's discuss that. And I couldn't believe they did that. So, I mean, could, should I have confronted them and say, no, I heard you talk about three in the house. What's that? I just, the whole thing was so strange. I felt completely unmoored to reality at that point. And I said, I'm just going to go. I think I have to go now. So I walked out drove home, and very shortly after, for what it's worth, Shirley left MUFON, and her husband passed, and um, never followed up with her in any meaningful way again, even though I had bumped into her at a couple MUFON things here and there. <coughs> never brought that subject up again. But, oddly enough, when I went home that night, and I laid in bed, I'm like, I don't need the light on. Don't need the radio on, the TV on, the fan on, the door blocked, the curtains closed anything on my floor, I'm okay. And from, oddly enough, from that moment in my hypnosis, my regression history, after I had that sort of white space experience, I've been able to sleep without any concern, even though things have continued to happen. Somehow it worked. I don't know how, but I guess I won't look a gift horse in the mouth. So... You were wondering about that Moldavite. <laughs> so, again, my family's moving out of the house because my parents are getting divorced. And it was two days before we were to move out of the house. The house everything's in boxes. A lot of the stuff has moved out already. And it's just me there and my parents. And so this is goodbye to the house, and I'm off into my adult life, essentially. And I'm in my room reading... And I go over to the bathroom again. I'm on my bath. My bedroom's on the third floor of a tri-level or the upstairs floor. My dad's watching TV. My mom's in the kitchen, probably doing a crossword book. And so, um, again, there's nothing in my room, barely anything. So I get up, go to the bathroom, come back, and there on the counter is the exact same piece of Moldavite 
that had disappeared like six years before. Still in a plastic baggie, and I remember it was shark two shaped with that little speck in it, and it was back. And so I'm like, I know my parents didn't have anything to do with this, gotta ask them anyway. So I ask them and they're like, no, I didn't know what you're talking about. So for whatever reason, whoever took it, they brought it back right at a moment when I was about to move out of the house. So I, I, don't, I don't know, I still have it. I've picked up other pieces, but I tell you, and I, I bet you there's some in the audience right now who, if they have any experience with Moldavite, whenever I give this presentation, somebody comes up to me and they said, yes, they used to have Moldavite, but it disappeared. It's a common thing. I remember even going, uh, once I was at a store, and I saw this guy with a Moldavite necklace, and what I thought was strange is that he still had his Moldavite. <laughs> so, so, so I go, oh, I, I like your necklace. And he goes, yeah, actually, it's my girlfriend's. I lost mine. He goes, strangest thing. So... The stuff, it comes, it goes. I don't know why. I don't know if it's got a mind of its own or if there's like, you know, on a UFO somewhere, they have like this collection, you know, of stuff <laughs> that they take from us and they decided to like, you know, give it back to me. So anyway, <clears throat> so it's uh, several years, it's 95 now and 91 was what I called my autumn apocalypse. And I had started to make inroads to my friends um, from high school, my good close friends that had done all this. The one guy, uh, Herb, I never got back in contact with. We've um, been, kept our distance for the rest of our lives. He was the real instigator. In fact, I'll, I will share this fun tidbit. He even wrote a song about it. Uh, he wrote a song about me. He said the lyrics were like... Um, You've got your head in your cloud, in the clouds. I've got your girlfriend, and now I'm the one who's proud. I, I, those were, I literally, like, those were the lyrics. So I'm like, okay, off the list, you know. <laughs> so, but the other friends, to whatever degree, time healed a lot of it. And so my friend John, he's got a cabin up north I'd been to occasionally, said, hey, you want to come up uh, for a skiing weekend at my cabin in Lewiston? And I'm like, sure, that sounds fun. And then a couple days later, he tells me, he's like, oh, by the way, Vicky will be there with her new husband. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, Did, does she know I'm going to be there? He goes, yeah, she doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to bother her, so it'll be okay. I'm like, hmm. And I'm like, I don't want to be the one to blink. You know, I don't want to be the one to back down. And she's, she's very low on my list. And... Um, so I decide, all right, I'm going to go anyway. There's going to be enough of us there. Sure. And so we go, and this is actually from that trip. Um, this is her, and this is her husband. Um, and he was a real piece of work. Um, <laughs> we gave him beer money, and he brought back the beer, cheapest beer he could find, which is Carling Black Label, because he said that way he could keep most of the money for himself from the beer purchase. He said that. Um, he went around most of the weekend shirtless, which, I mean, I wouldn't do, and really nobody appreciated that he did. And a friend of ours made a pot of chicken noodle soup, to which when he was done eating the contents of it, he poured the broth back into the pot. All of that, yeah. And he went around, and he went around, it, like, poking people, like, what do you do for a living? Oh, that job's no good. I work in computers, he kept saying. And it turned out the computer he was using was the uh, register at Subway sandwiches. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, nothing, nothing wrong with working in fast food, you know. We've all done it, but to say you're working in computers, and then that's your, okay. So it was, it was he was so bad, it was laughable. And, and, it, and, it, and so it was actually starting to loosen up a little bit. Like, how could I take her seriously if she's with him? First of all, like, how could... She, my first thought was, how could anybody put me and him in the same category of people, you know, she dated? But then I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, I don't care. It's just so silly. So now there were so many of us that went that we had to be creative with our sleeping space. Um, due to Vicky and her husband's 
um, combined mass, they took the largest, they took the largest bed in, in the cabin. And so for me, I was a bit lighter at the time, and I found that with some of the, the furniture cushions um, uh, from the, the, the porch, I could put them in the bathtub and sleep in the bathroom, which was closed at the time because the water wasn't running. And so people had to use the outhouse. So I'm sleeping in the bathroom. Okay, so I'm in the bathtub, laying there on these cushions, and they're in the room right next to the bathroom. And I hear them start to sweet talk and giggle. And then, yep. <laughs> and they're very loud. And it was so ridiculous. I'm like, I'm like this girl who ruined my life is in the next room having sex with this crazy guy and I'm laying in the room next to them listening to it in a bathtub. <laughs> and, and I just started laughing, I, laughing really hard. And most other people in the, in the cabin were asleep. And I, I was laughing so hard I couldn't contain myself. So I went out running. I'm like, I can't, I can't even be here. So I dash out the cabin door and I go running down the street. And then I realized, well, maybe I should have brought my jacket. And then I'm like, oh, this place looks familiar. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and so I see the house exactly as it was up ahead of me. I'd never gone down the street from his place like this. And so I'm like, I'm already there. So I walk up to the place. I look over to where the little being was, and he's gone. Meaning, and what I took from that was, because after that moment in the bathtub, all the pain, all the pressure, everything, all the tension was lifted. And I was whole again. And it seemed to be that they knew that at that moment that this would be the sign that I could get back into life again. And I just enjoyed myself the rest of the weekend. So here's everybody that went. <laughs> It's clearly, I had a good time the next day. <laughs> so, so, so I was free again, free to love again, and all that. So, and we're getting uh, close to the end here. So, um, sure enough, I started dating. Started I, um, that summer of '95. I dated this girl, Tammy. And, and this is an actual picture of she and I from the very day that I'm describing. So it comes a point when you have these types of experiences and you're dating, you have to tell the other person that you're having these types of experiences. Because one, they could think you're crazy, and more importantly, at some point, if you really get to be a couple together all the time, they're gonna be around when something happens to you. And so you like to find that sort of sweet spot, not lead in with it, unless you think that would work. Um, but for the most part, this is one of those things you kind of hold on to just a little bit. And then you say, oh, what do you think of this show, uh, Unexplained, uh, you know, Unsolved Mysteries or whatever. You just sort of toes go in first. And then you say, oh, you know, I saw a UFO when I was 10. That's how you imagine it going. Anyway, that's not how it went here. So, <laughs> so, so she and I had not had, I had not had to talk with her yet. And we went out to this, uh, this park, and we spent the day walking around, and then she says, hey, let's watch the sunset. We we're going to go home, and they're like, oh, yeah, let's watch the sunset. So we climbed up this hill. This is the actual hill. And then we're up there on the hill, and um, the sun goes down, and she's like, oh, let's stargaze. So um, stargaze was code for smoochy stuff. And so <laughs> we put down the blanket, and we were kissing a little bit. And it's dark outside, and you can hear the frogs all around and other woodsy noises. And then suddenly, all the noises stopped, just cut out. And we both stopped, and like, hmm. And then you could hear distinctly foot, footsteps coming up the hill. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I'm like, what a sucker. I'm like, I took her to this, this park in the middle of the night, out where nobody else is. What a complete trap. I'm like, dang it. 
you know, my defense of awareness, you know, right? So anyway, so then we both get up because we're kind of spooked from hearing these steps, but we don't, neither of us want to verbalize what we're, what's happening. So we're up on the top of the hill and we're just kind of looking around and she says, uh, oh, look, it's uh, the Big Dipper. And I said, no, in fact, that's the Little Dipper. And I know because I just had an astronomy class and she's like, oh yeah, you know, the price of textbooks these days, yada, yada. And so after a while, we felt comfortable, could hear the frogs. And then we went to lay down again on the blanket. And we did, and then the frog stopped. We heard footsteps coming up the hill. Now, it's hard to tell this story because for some reason at that moment, I couldn't remember that that had just happened a moment ago. It was as if it was happening again for the first time. So we go up uh, on the top of the hill. She says, look, it's the Big Dipper. I said, Little Dipper, price of textbooks. And I'm like, I'm having this feeling of deja vu, but I can't quite figure it out. So then we go, uh, the frogs pick up again. We go back on the blanket again. Footstep, frogs stop again. Footsteps come up again. We go to the center of the hill again. And she's like, look, it's the Big Dipper. And that's when it hit me. I'm like, oh my gosh, we not only just had this talk, but we've had it at least twice. I mean, and I may have forgotten more repetitions, but uh, I, and I'm just telling it how it happened, unfiltered. I know it's strange, you know, I never said it was possible, it's only true kind of a thing. So we're up there and then suddenly, when I realize that, we're both paralyzed. We're looking at each other, completely paralyzed. I can move the eyes a little bit, then footsteps coming up the hill, three little gray guys, come up to her, as if I'm not even there, come up to her and they're looking her up and down and I can hear their telepathic banter. Mm, no, not her. Mm -mm. No, she's not the one. No, she won't do. It's no good. And I'm like, come on, guys. So, so, but really, I mean, it really, we're terrified. So, I mean, to be honest, but uh, so, so anyway, so then they walk away. We can move again grabbed our stuff, ran to the car, which I swear was more than a half mile away, and got in the car, and we're completely silent. We drive back to Sterling Heights, where we both lived, and she says, then she says, I don't want to go home yet. And, and she says, I'm not ready to go home yet. So we went to, I don't know if you have uh, Meyer Thrifty Acres around here. It's essentially, it's like a big box store, like a Walmart, uh, open 24 hours, so we walk in, and we're walking up and down the aisles, looking at mops, cans of soup, just anything to ground ourselves in reality, in consumerism, I guess. And then they had a pet department at the time, and it was late, so we went and watched the uh, hamsters who were active at that time. Sat there for maybe 20 minutes to half an hour just watching the hamsters, and then she says, okay, I can go home now. So we go, and I drop her off home, and uh, not a kiss or a hug or anything like that. She just stepped out. The next day, no communication between us. The next day, she calls to break up. And while I never said that what had happened had anything to do with me, it was pretty clear she knew that it had everything to do with me. But, um, but that would not deter me. I just uh, then knew to f um, basically... Um, if you're an experiencer, you can find the most comfort from an experiencer. And while people can be supportive in your life, um, if they haven't had this kind of an experience, if you're an experiencer and you can find love with another experiencer, um, you're really blessed. And so that was my path forward without getting too much into my personal life in the last five minutes I have here. And then for the rest of it was MUFON. There was a lot of very compassionate people in the organization that allowed me to find a family here um, in the, not only in the MUFON community, not only in the UFO, UFO community, but the broader paranormal community. Um, I find I most feel most normal when I'm around other people <laughs> having weird things, who have had weird things happen to them. Um, a great person that uh, I was... Uh, was very kind to me, uh, Bud Hopkins, if you know the name, he was wonderful and a great part of MUFON while he was still with us. 
And um, yeah, so I got more involved with MUFON and uh, joined, like I said, in 93, back during the time I had regressions. In 2004, I become state director and I'm with it ever since, trying to help other people um, come to grips that this is a real thing. In my life, I, there was no doubt, there was no question. It was my very first memory in life. So this, was, this, is, this is me. I had a, a fellow experiencer, Sandy Nichols, once asked me, did I ever wish this had never happened in my life? And I, I told him quite honestly, I said, I wouldn't recognize myself. This phenomena is as valid of a part of my life as any other part of my life. And I can't say that I would give it up. Um, it, it's been a very strange ride and it continues to be a strange ride. And I do have two books. Like I said, um, I am in the vending area with my two books. They're just 10 bucks a piece. And it tells not only what I've told today during this time frame, but there are other stories that I couldn't include um, f due to time constraints. And I do also go into deeper detail about some of the things here. And so I um, love it if you uh, pick up a, a copy if you, and then also for the other experiencers that are speaking uh, this week, like Penny and Chad, please uh, come and attend their talks too and hear what they have to say about their personal experiences. Um, thanks to you so much. If you see a UFO, please report it to MUFON. If you want to investigate UFOs, there's no better place to do it for MUFON. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>